Troisodiolchandi, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. So hi, yes, my name is Naomi. I'm here on behalf of North Ceredigion Bat Group tonight to chat to you about the bats of the Dovey biosphere. Um, so bats of the Dovey catchment of um, North Ceredigion, which is what I, uh, I focus on both through my hobby and my work. So tonight we are going to look at what exactly is a bat? We're going to look at some UK and Welsh species. We're going to look at the species profiles of um, bats that we can find on the dovey, as well as looking into local conservation about bats, what's happening at the moment and in the future, and most importantly, how you can get involved in bat conservation. So quickly, just a brief introduction to North Ceredigion Bat Group. So we have been going since 1992. Well, I haven't, but we still have some founding members still in the group. Shout out to Annette. <laughs> I think she's here tonight. So our group is a mixture of professional ecologists and volunteers. So a mixture of professional interest and personal enthusiasm. And we mostly focus on the National Bat Monitoring Programme, which I will be talking about quite a bit this evening. So sometimes we do a few other projects. This is a bit of harp trapping to do some bat ringing. We also do a fair bit of public engagement. So this is us last year at Longwood before uh, we had a few restrictions imposed. So can't wait to get back to those days. And obviously we do a little bit of bat care as well. So I'm the lead bat carer for the area. Um, thinking about the Dovey catchment, if you are in the North Dovey area or you're watching this and you're living in North Wales, there are bat carers based in Welshpool and in Gwynedd. So have a, have, a, uh, have a Google if you ever find a bat in trouble or call the Bat Conservation Trust helpline and they'll be able to sort you out. I'll talk about that again a little bit later in the presentation. So yes, this is Gerald. Gerald is one of my patients from last year. He was luckily rehabbed and then released, but he's a brown long-eared bat. And I think they're my favorite sort of bat. Just goes to show that they can, uh, bats are quite interesting, interesting species. And so he has ears are about the size of his head. No, not even the size of his head, the size of his body is the size of his ears. He can curl them up behind his head to go to sleep. So let's start about what is a bat? Well, what is a bat? What comes to your mind when you think about the word bat? Do you think about spooky Halloween things? Do you think about film characters or characters from popular culture like Dracula? Do you think about vampire bats? Or do you think about the lovely big bats that we see in zoos and on television programs, those flying foxes from Africa and Australia? Well, let's have a think about what exactly are bats. Well, firstly, bats are mammals, fairly and truly mammals. So that means they have warm blood, they have fur, and they feed their young on milk just like we do as humans. And they have just one baby a year because they put a lot of time and investment into that one little baby. Because bats are incredibly long lived and some species in this country can live up to 30 years. They are the only true flying mammal. So that means those flying squirrels, no, that's nothing on a bat. So a bat has the capacity for true flight, meaning it can propel itself up from the ground or from standing and it doesn't need to glide from a height to uh, in order to fly. And it's a very, very diverse group of animals. So there are over 1400 species of bat worldwide. In terms of mammals of the world, of every, of every four mammals, one is a bat. So a quarter of the mammal species are made up of bats because they are found on every continent on earth except Antarctica, where it gets a little bit too chilly for them. So bats have been present in our fossil record for a very, very long time. Their basic body shape has sort of stayed the same for a, for a fair few million years now. So a lot of their adaptations have been done on the outside, on the fleshy bits. So they're categorized into order Chiroptera or Chiroptera, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The direct translation essentially means hand wing. I love this diagram because you can see the different bones of the human arm and the bat arm. We're looking at the same bones, it's just moved about a bit. So a bat's arm is essentially like having your hand glued to the side of your elbow with a skin flap from your thumb all the way down to your feet, tying your feet together and then all the back way up your body and to your other thumb. So it's a bit like wearing your own parachute sleeping bag. 
fantastic adaptations for flight there. And so bats, again, they have a pretty basic mammalian skeleton. They have lovely small bones, very light to keep them obviously light and uh, airborne. And then they have this wonderful wing membrane here. So this is just skin in between their fingers here that helps them fly. And so they use the muscles on their fingers individually to help them orientate themselves in the air. And so, like I said, bats have evolved many different ways to adapt to changing environments and different environments around the world. So here we have tent making bats from South America. They utilize broken and uh, decaying palm fronds as lovely shelters from all the rain in the rainforest. Still in South America, we also have the long nosed bat. So this bat has a very, very long snout, with a very long tongue that allows it to penetrate down into the bottom of very long lipped flowers. So things that other animals normally couldn't get to, the long nosed bat gets to the nectar at the bottom with its incredibly long snout. Now, if we move over to Vietnam, we have the griffin's leaf nose bat. So the nose leaf is a combination of skin flaps arranged on the face that allows the bat to navigate in different ways in its environment. We'll get onto that in a little bit. And so bats are incredibly important within the ecosystem. So they're pollinators, pest controllers, and they disperse seeds throughout the environment. Well, those that eat fruit do. And over 500 plant species on the planet require bats as part of their life cycle in order to disperse their seeds. The agave plant in particular is one of those, and that's where we get tequila from. So no bats, no tequila, unfortunately. And vampire bats. Now, I'm sure they get more press than any other bat on the planet, but vampire bats, there are only really three species. So three species of bat that suck blood. And you'll be pleased to know that they all live in South America. Now, these bats have incredibly specially adapted saliva that has a lovely ugly, ag oh, if I could say it, anticoagulant properties in it. So that means once they bite an animal, it only needs one little bite to get the blood flowing and then the bat can keep, keep lapping it up for the entirety of its meal without having to further injure its host. And as well, another thing that I love about the common vampire bat, its Latin name is Desmodus rotundus. And so I always imagine a really fat squishy bat whenever I think of Desmodus rotundus. So if you're a little bit scared of bats, just think of a nice fat chubby round bat and hopefully your fear will subside a little bit. So when we're thinking about bats, we're thinking about how they're built in terms of their body. So taxonomically through their DNA, we tend to split them into two groups. We have the megabats and the microbats. And typically not every microbat is bigger than a megabat. Not every megabat is smaller than a microbat, but just for the purposes of what we're talking about today, all British bats are microbats. So that's all of the bats that we'll come into contact with in the wild. Excuse me. So we have 17 breeding species in the UK at the moment. So we have the common pipistrelle, which is our smallest bat, coming in at about three to seven grams. And then the noctule, which is our biggest bat, coming in at about 30 grams. So even though the noctule is the biggest bat, its wingspan doesn't get very much bigger than 80 centimeters. So technically, compared to the world's bats, that's not very big at all. So 17 or 18 species, depending on when your book was published, can sort of depend on how many species that we've reported. So the uh, common and soprano pipistrels were only split apart in terms of their uh, species in 1993. So there's uh, quite a lot of updating, um, updating that needs to be done on quite a few bat texts. And this is one of them. So this sad, sad, lonely male, this one greater mouse-eared bat, that used to come every winter and hibernate in a tunnel. Uh, he used to come every single year, but sadly hasn't come since 2018. And so this was our one non-breeding species of bat. They're often found on the continent, but not in Britain. But unfortunately, as he's not been seen for the past three years, I think we can safely conclude that we're now definitely down to just 17 species in Britain. Although this may change with climate change and warming conditions, we may see a couple of bats from the continent moving over. So it, it might be in a couple of years, we actually get an increase of greater mouse-eared bat. We'll have to add it back onto the list. So if we think about the 17 spe species in the UK, 12 of them occur in Wales. 
and these ones with the red squares around them are the red squares red rectangles around them are the ones that you're most likely to come into contact with just in everyday life and when you're outside on a bat survey so we're thinking about the dovey catchment here so thinking about bats activity at the moment in february most bats are asleep although i have had a couple of reports of a few making the most of the nice weather recently and going out very quickly for a, a little midge snack so Bats are one of our species that hibernate, so their breathing slows down, their metabolism slows down, and this saves energy, primarily so they can get through the winter without having to wake up and without having to feed, because there is just no food available for them in the winter. But of course, with climate change, planet warming, this may change, so we may see behavioural changes in bats as the years go on. But as it stands, they emerge in about March or April time, depending on the weather, and their main goal is to put on weight because they've probably not eaten much for the past couple of months. And why do they need to be fat? Well, they need to be fat and ready to mate because one of the most important things that any animal does in its life cycle is mating. So batties, like I said before, they only really have one pup a year. Very uncommon for a bat to have twins because mum, she's incredibly attentive, she will carry that baby with her until it's about three weeks of age. And at that point, the pup can weigh up to 30% of mum's weight, which is quite ridiculous. And so at their independence age at about six weeks, that's when I as a bat carer tend to get quite a lot of calls of people finding young bats stranded on the ground because they've fallen off mum. But thankfully, that's an easy fix because we'll just take them back up to mum at night and sometimes if you pop them up on somewhere high mum will actually fly in and come and collect them and take them away which is fantastic to watch. So bats like to live together, they like to live in roosts, so this is a lovely roost of brown long-eared bats and you can find roosts pretty much anywhere because bats have had to adapt to a changing environment they utilize human spaces quite a lot so Smaller species like the pipistrelles will choose modern buildings. Apexes of roofs tend to be a firm favourite, whereas your woodland species like the noctuals and horseshoes will tend to frequent in holes. Um, some with horseshoes, they like areas that are tunnelly and dark. Churches as well provide a fantastic roof, roosting opportunities for species that like to have warm-ups before they leave the roost so species like the brown long-eared bat that require quite a lot of warm-up space before they leave the roost for the evening of course because of unfortunately declining bat numbers all roosts are protected regardless of the size all roosts are protected under law and so it's something that we need to consider when we think about our human behavior and how it has impacted bats because unfortunately the reason they have declined is down to us and so ultimately we can be responsible for improving their improving their numbers and improving how bats can utilize habitats around humans one example that i'd like to point out is just a, a, an aspect of artificial lighting so even thinking about changing how you use lights in the garden green space can offer up more opportunities for bats to forage in your garden. So here's just an example of some light pollution. And if we think about as a bat, this area probably would have had different levels of foraging. So we're looking at the noctuals flying over at the top, middle lane species, so like pipistrelles who tend to fly at mid height. And then you've got your doorbenton species at the bottom that will take insects off of the river. So we're looking at about three species at least that are using this area as well as those that will be roosting in the bridge itself and in adjacent trees. So by having this artificial light influencing the bats, it may not influence things like the pipistrelles, but for light phobic species or light intolerant species, as we say, like the brown long-eared bat, the horseshoes, this can have some serious impacts on their ability to use the area. Unfortunately, it means that many bats now can no longer forage in areas that are incredibly well lit. So that's when if ever you're putting in lighting for any sort of system, it's important to think about what type of lighting you have and where you're putting it and how it's arranged and affecting the area. So that's just another thing that is important to think about when talking about bats. Because of course, even though bats are 
people say bats are blind, but they're not at all. Bats can see pretty well. It's just that they use their ears for echolocation in terms of finding things to eat. And bats have a very fast metabolism. They need to eat half their body weight a night. And so one of our smallest bats, the pipistrelle, they can eat about 3,000 midges in one evening. Remember what I was saying about them being good pest controllers? Oh yes, there's something I just love about being out on a lovely summer evening and feeling the bats whiz around my head, feeding on all the flies that are coming around to feed on my carbon dioxide breath and my lovely, my lovely blood, which midges seem to really enjoy. <laughs> so brown long-eared bats, you'll quite often find carcasses of yellow underwing moths. They seem to be a preferred favourite of the brown long-eared. And noctuals and the larger bats that eat beetles like cockchafers, they'll leave their carapaces lying around. So often at the entrances of roosts, you'll find discarded beetles as well as quite a lot of poop. And so we use echolocation as a way to identify bats, but they also have different flight styles. Because if you're thinking about their flying at different heights, different heights will obviously have different obstacles. And that sort of predisposes different bats to having different ways of maneuvering in the environment. So here's a lovely piece of footage from Ian Baker. Now this is in one of the resource lists that will be down in the comments. So feel free to go look this up on YouTube. It's uh, actually no, it's on Vimeo. So this is a fantastic video of a slowed down image of a pipistrel hunting a midge. So this is a pipistrel using its echolocation to find this midge and then it's using its wings and its entire body to scoop this midge out of the air and bring it up towards the mouth so the bat can feed. And the whole clip of this is about three minutes long and it's fantastic and I would highly recommend you going to watch it. Because bats use echolocation as a form of navigating their environment. So they use ultrasound. So this is sounds that are so high pitched that we can't hear them. They sound them out and so the sound waves leave the bat as vibrations. They hit surfaces around and those vibrations will come back and the bat is able to sense those using its ears and other parts of its body and is able to interpret that into a soundscape. So it creates a visual map within its brain, an audio landscape of what it's actually looking at. And so this echolocation, these high frequency calls, we can't hear them, of course. And so we have to utilize things like bat detectors. So I have one of those magentas. So in the picture here, I love these magentas. And so these ones go for about 50 quid, although you might be able to pick one up secondhand a little bit cheaper. I got one mine for my birthday last year and it's got a sticker of a noctule on it because I'm really cool. <laughs> There are quite a few different detectors on the uh, market at the moment. So entry level detectors, you're looking at a heterodyne. So that's a magenta five. This is a magenta four. That one's got a nice digital display on it, although the function is essentially the same. Although if you're looking to upgrade your kit to something a bit more high tech and swanky, there is now the echo meter touch. So this is a very tiny bat detector that you essentially stick on the top of your phone or tablet. And this will identify the bat for you. Now, pinch of salt, always use it on a very highly sensitive mode and make sure to add your location when you're using it because that will help the, uh, the detector identify the bat species for you. And it'll show you visually what the call looks like in a sonogram as well. So if you've got about 150 pounds to splash on something a bit interesting, then definitely go for the echo meter. So again, that would make a lovely present for somebody. So a bit special. And so what do these calls actually sound like to the human ear? Well, so like I said, we can't really hear them. So the only way we can is by using detectors. And so these are what the calls sound like through a detector. So you might need to turn your volume up, but I'll play them twice so you can hear them. So this is a common pipistrelle. So the pipistrelles, smaller bats, they tend to call at the lower side of the spectrum, at the uh, quite a medium level of the spectrum. So between 45 and 55 kilohertz of these peak frequencies. Remember I said before, common and soprano pipistrelles were only actually separated as individual species in 1993, and mainly because they look the same and they sound the same. So you had to have a backup for DNA on this one. So common pipistrelles, like to call at about 45 kilohertz, and it sounds a bit like this. Again. 
So a veritable mix of chips and chops in that call. Now, soprano is incredibly similar. You can generally only tell when a bat with a, using a bat detector, so you can see whether your peak frequency is at 45, or if it's at 55, like a pipistrelle, because slightly higher call from this bat. Now, I want to see if you can hear the little the little in this call. So in between those little bubbles, you could hear a little sort of farty raspberry noise. That's what we call a feeding buzz. If you think back to that video of the pipistrelle bringing itself up to eat that midge, that feeding buzz is just a section of very, 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 very fast calls, increasing, increasing, increasing as the bat gets closer and closer to its prey. So that little tells you that a bat has found its prey and that it's caught something for dinner. So soprano pipistrelles, they're our most common bat and the most bat that you're most likely to come into contact with pretty much anywhere in the UK. They are our smallest bats and incredibly similar, and they like to roost in very large numbers. So our bat group monitors a roost down on the Rydal, and I think we had about 350 there one year. That was fantastic. And again, they like to roost in more modern places, so you will find them in modern build houses. Moving on to our biggest bat, the noctual bat. So this is a bigger bat, and because it's slightly bigger, it calls a bit lower down. So think, yeah, bigger bat, lower call, and tends to be a bit more slower than Pipistrelle. Flip floppy is this one, rather than very fast and chippy. Play that again quickly. Now, noctuals are one of the bats that come out earliest in the evening. So they come out just before sunset and they're very high flying bats. So you'll quite often hear them before you see them with noctuals. You'll hear this flip flop, flip flop coming from far away and you'll look up and you'll see this batty shape flying very slowly across. In the summer, they can get mixed up with swallows and swifts. So it's always worth having your bat detector out with you. So noctuals are our biggest bat and they have quite a low frequency call and they eat the largest insects are things like cockchafers. And they're very dependent on woodland habitats, both to live and both to feed. Moving on to a different type of bat now. So this is a myotis species of bat, the door bentons. So this is the water bat. So this bat feeds on and around freshwater areas. It has lovely hairy feet that it utilizes for grabbing those insects. So it calls at around 48, 47 kilohertz at peak frequency. And it's very, very fast, quite quiet and sounds like this. Okay, again, that was very, very fast. Now, even professional ecologists and bat enthusiasts find it incredibly difficult to separate myotis species just using a heterodyne bat detector. So don't beat yourself up if you can't tell the difference between species. Just knowing it's a myotis bat is good enough most of the time. So Dorbentons are water bat. So it feeds over rivers and streams. Uh, interesting way to see how it does this is by looking at the strategy of the bulldog bat. So that's a much bigger bat. It utilizes a very similar strategy as the Dorbentons to feed on larger things like fish and amphibians. And we don't get them in this country. And so it's interesting to see how they have co-evolved um, in this country, the Dorbentons utilizing um, smaller features to utilize our insects where we don't really have as many fish and amphibians as in other countries. And so the myotis like to roost in old stoneworks and barns, things like that. You'll often find them roosting in caves over the winter. Another bat that you'll find roosting in caves over the winter is the greater and lesser horseshoes. So these are, again, a completely different family of bats. So in terms of how we classify them, we have the horseshoes in one category and we have all of the other bats in the other category. So we have two of the horseshoe species in, in Britain and they have a fantastic nose leaf that, funny enough, is in the shape of a horseshoe. And this nose leaf 
means that they're utilizing sound waves in a different way to the other bats. And as a result of this, their calls sound completely different. So even though a greater horseshoe is almost as big as a noctule, it calls all the way up at 83 kilohertz because the noise is so different. Now this one is quite loud, so I'll just turn it down a little bit. So this is a greater horseshoe. This is coming, this is a noise coming from a bat. Oh, let me play it. Play that one again. I think that's fantastic. I think it sounds like space aliens or UFOs or something like that. So the lesser horseshoe is incredibly similar to the greater. It calls at slightly higher frequency because again, it's a lot smaller and it has that similar wibbity wibbity alien type sound that the greater horseshoe has, but it's a much higher frequency. I think it genuinely sounds like a spaceship. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. And so greater and lesser horseshoes are also the only bats that we have that are dangly bats. And so most of our bats are crevice dwelling bats, meaning that they will just cutch up in crevices and holes and things like that. But greater and lesser horseshoes are danglers and they need to dangle in spaces, which is why tunnels, mines, old churches are a fantastic habitat for them. And so we are lucky enough to actually monitor a lesser horseshoe roost as part of the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Uh, I said I'd come back to it, I haven't forgotten. So the National Bat Monitoring Programme is essentially a survey that takes place every single year. So it's the same survey every year at the same time. Do four counts, two counts in June, two counts in July. Oh no, two counts in May, two counts in June, excuse me. And we essentially, we know uh, an emergence. So if you know a roost and emergence point, we count the bats as they come out of the roost, we have a time of the sunset and we time how long we watch for and we record the weather and the temperature. And that's all, it's an incredibly simple survey, anyone can do it and you don't really even need a bat detector. As long as you know what species that you've got, you can count them as they come out. But again, I would recommend having a detector if you want to do it properly. So we're again very lucky to have a lesser horseshoe roost now I'm sure some of you will recognize this building. This is the Iron Furnace at Furnace. So just outside Egloisvach and just down the road from RSPB Unis here. And for those of you with a good memory, will remember when Springwatch was at Unis here in 2012, I think it was, they put a live camera into the furnace. And so they got some live shots of the lesser horseshoe bats that live there very jealous because I only get to watch them from the outside. So we sort of sit here and count the bats as they come out. So lesser horseshoes, they have a bit of a restricted distribution to the Wales and southwest of England. So in terms of their conservation, it's very much focused on Wales and South England. So that's a, an important thing to remember. So they've got the nose leaf because they're the horseshoes. Lesser horseshoes are about the size of a plum. And because of the way that their wings have a nice purpley sheen on them, they do sometimes look like dangly plums as they're there dangling on the cave ceiling. And so I'll play their call again, because again, it's one of my favorites. Unique, unique. So we've been monitoring this roost officially for the past four years, five years. Unfortunately, we, won't we weren't able to do a count in 2020 due to corona restrictions, but it doesn't really matter. We have a nice wealth of data from previous years. Something very interesting happened in 2019 though. We had our first ever greater horseshoe turn up. Now that was very exciting for a number of reasons because Greater horseshoes tend not to be found this far north in Wales. And this sighting at Furness added to a handful of other reports. So Tony Cross, the infamous bird ringer, caught one in his bird net down on the Larry by the boatyard. And I've had a few other reports of people picking them up on their bat detectors over the past couple of years. So I'm certain that there must be a population or a, or a roost of greater horseshoe bats somewhere on the dovey. Pretty sure it's on the south side somewhere. So I'm 
asking people for records. Do you have current records or historical records for uh, Greater Horseshoes? Because I'm planning to collate all of these records to make a map of the area with the hope that then we can identify any roots, uh, any roosts or any primary foraging areas in order to protect them in the future and maybe even provide some habitat improvement. So of course I need your help if you're out and about doing any bat detecting in the next year or so then please send me your sightings. North Ceredigion Bat Group, we're on Facebook and on email. Let me know what you've got, even lesser horseshoes because that can sort of pinpoint us in the direction of where we might find habitat that's suitable for horseshoes. And another of our roosts that um, is one of my favourites is our brown long-eared roost. Now this one is just down the road from me, so I was able to, uh, to do a count during lockdown. So this roost occurs in a very, very basic house. Now this house is, I suppose, important for brown long-eareds because it has its old attic space. So I don't know if you remember me saying before, Brown long eards they like to have a good warm up before they leave the roost for the evening. So they like to just go round and round and round in circles through their roost. Now, brown long eards thankfully, are quite widespread and abundant when it comes to bat distribution in the UK. They call the whispering bats as their call is quite light and fluttery. And so sometimes you can miss them on a bat detector if, you're, if you don't know that they're there. So here's just an example of their call. Again, quite faint. That was it. Listen hard. It almost sounds a bit like a, um, a Geiger counter ticking. Now, of course, I can only assume that this small, quiet call is an adaptation somehow because the brown long-eared has such big ears. I wonder if by having a, sh having a shorter, quieter call, that makes hunting easier somehow. There's some science come out quite recently showing that um, some moths can actually deflect bat calls using the scales on their wings. I'll add a link in the comments because it's just a fantastic thing to read about. Definitely take five minutes out of your day with a cup of tea to read about that. So going back to the brown long eards, we've been monitoring this roost for about 10 years, which is brilliant because that means that we have a lovely widespread big data set that we can look at and it helps us understand how the bats are active in the area. And so throughout all of this measuring, we tend to have an average count of around 36 bats. So we think that we've probably reached a carrying capacity for this roost. Uh, we think that there was a bumper year in 2014. And because there is a bit of a low, uh, a low ebb in 2015, we think that possibly a few bats moved away to create another roost nearby. Now this is again very interesting in terms of um, bat conservation and I personally would love to find it. So I think one of my projects once lockdown is over is to walk around and have a look for bat, bat suitable properties in the area. But again it just shows that we have a lovely stable bat roost where we are and we're very very lucky that the owners of the bat roost keep their garden nice and bat friendly and have a lot of nice plants and lots of wild growth there to promote insects that the bats love. So bat monitoring program really is a survey for anybody. Anyone can do it. As long as you know where the roost is and you have the landowner's permission to count them, then you're away. So Bat Conservation Trust has a wealth of resources. So there's loads of YouTube videos, if that's how you prefer to learn. And there's also a lot of written information on their website. So us as groups, we would normally come out and try and help you with bat monitoring program and we do quite a lot of walks and other things with community groups but unfortunately corona's put a stop to that for the moment can't wait to be out and about again so what can you do at home to help bats in the meantime well let your garden go wild think about what bats are trying to eat they want insects so if your garden can create them some insects then that's fantastic maybe build a bird but uh, Build a bat box and a bird box. Build all the boxes. <laughs> They're a fantastic craft idea, something that gets the kids engaged, can even work as maybe a homeschooling project. Again, Bat Conservation Trust has all the resources on their website. I'll pop a link to some instructions in the comments. Build a pond. Again, ponds generate lots of insect life, which is brilliant for bats. And also, if you have a moggy friend, keep your cat indoors at night. 
especially in the summer months. So we're thinking about July and August, especially when there are a couple of younger bats who are weaker flyers, not necessarily the quickest about getting up off of the ground. Cats, unfortunately, are responsible for, I'd say, the majority of euthanasia cases that I have to deal with as a bat carer. So either bats come to me already dead or, unfortunately, I'm the one that has to do it. And that's all because people feel bad about keeping their cats indoors. But ultimately, they are fantastic predators at the end of the day. So, I mean, if you are able to keep your cat indoors during peak bat baby season in August, then that'll be a plus. If you can keep them indoors all summer, then that would be even better. I'm sure the birds, the birds and the small mammals would love that as well. So if you have a spare five minutes, pop on to the Bat Conservation Trust website. They have digital copies of all of their information resources packs. So we have Stars of the Night, which is a fantastic um, encouraging bats to your garden leaflet. I've put direct, direct links for these PDFs in the comments. I love these ones especially. What bat is that is the one that has all of the different flight styles of the common bats on it. Bats and Buildings is if you want a bit more uh, technical information about the legal status of bats and buildings and developments, things like that. So Bat Conservation Trust, a wealth of different resources depending on what you're looking for. So if you're homeschooling, looking for teaching, community groups looking for something a bit interesting, or if you're just like me and you're just a general bat enthusiast and you're wanting to learn about bats, their website has loads of free resources. But if you've got a bit of pocket money, then I would highly recommend the FSC pullout guide for bats. So this is only about £3.50 and you can probably get them in a bundle with a couple of other things, a uh, uh, reduced price on their website or something, but would highly recommend as this not only has all of the physical characteristics of the different bats, it also has a huge guide on the back that has their flight style, their peak frequency and their preferred habitat. So in terms of the information per pound, you get very good value for money in this. But again, if you wanted to maybe get a bit more into your bats, General mammal books like this British Mammals has uh, sections on bats. So these nice photo guides have generally got um, good bat sections that cover all of the bat species that we have in the UK. And of course, with this one, you get all of the other British species as well. So this is slightly more expensive between 50 to 15 to 25 pounds. Again, makes a, a brilliant gift for someone. And then if you want to learn even more about bats, there are bat specific guides. So I bought this one for myself recently. Bats of Britain and Europe. And so even though we've only got 17 species, I think this guide is great because it has a massive wealth of photographs. It has information about the ecology of all European species and it has identification tips on all European species as well. So that's something for the bat enthusiast in your life, a little bit more pricey between 35 to 45 pounds. So again, makes, makes a nice Christmas present or something like that. And of course, you can always join us once lockdown is over and once we're back to normal again, or at least back to some version of normality, join, join us. So we're North, Car North Caridigian Bat Group. We're based in Aberystwyth, but we do count up in the Dovey biosphere, but also down in South Caridigian. This is us on the roof of Llanacairon um, National Trust. We're waiting for the brown long ears to come out and we're just counting them there. So yes, please join us if you're able and give us a follow on Facebook for lots of just batty information and things like that. Here is the number that you need for bat care. If you ever have trouble with bats, just pop this number in your phone right now so you have it with you wherever you go, just in case you find a bat. You never know. Gerald says, please put this in your phone now so you can help. <laughs> and of course, Bat Conservation Trust is a um, perfect place to go for all of your bat needs. If you're thinking about maybe starting a career in bat surveying, wanting a bit more information about that, there are also people to go to. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you this evening, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Feel free to contact uh, our bat group on Facebook. You can follow us, um, again, Facebook, uh, North Caridigian Bat Group, or you can follow me. So I'm at Natir Naomi, so nature spelled the Welsh way. And I'm on Twitter, on Facebook, and I'm more than happy to take questions about bats and also um, queries about maybe potential site visits in the future. 
and also information about greater horseshoes if you have them. So yes, please let me know. Thank you for listening and uh, I'll hope to catch up with you soon when we're finally out and about. Okay, bye.